We are descendants of one of the great spiritual traditions of humanity. And some of those traditions have billions of followers, and we have many fewer. And most of the people who are descended from that Yerusha, from that inheritance, either don't care about it or, or want to hold it so tight they're going to squeeze it to death and can't get anything good out of it. So we who are in the middle have a very special responsibility toward its creative future. You're one of a relatively small group of people who can make worthwhile and creative use of it. And we, the Jewish people, need you to be open to that because you have this special gift. Hey Seekers, Shaul here. Today, I have the privilege of sharing a conversation with Professor Arthur Green, who we will introduce in just a moment. For those of you who might not remember me in my previous videos, besides for being a good friend and fan of Zevi, I've also been on my own journey for the past few years exploring my own form of pan-mysticism. I was raised and educated in the Hasidic world, but sometime in my mid-twenties, I began to struggle with the exclusive nature of my spiritual education and felt more and more drawn to and in love with Buddhism, poetry, so many of the incredible topics and traditions that Zevi discusses here at Seekers of Unity. Unlike much of the stigma surrounding those who leave the Hasidic community and any other religious insular community, that we were just looking for a reason to leave I felt that my journey was quite the opposite. I was desperately looking for a reason to stay. While I deeply still love Hasidic thought and mysticism, the Nagunim, the melodies, the rituals, I struggled to remain a religious monogamist as I fell deeper and deeper in love with the rich vastness of ideas, texts, and rituals prevalent across the world's cultures and spiritual traditions. My journey leaving Judaism has been a solo and lonely one neither feeling truly seen in either the secular nor the religious world. That was until I encountered and was exposed to neo-Hasidism, the works of Martin Buber, Rabbi Zalman Shech Shalomi, Professor Arthur Green and others, in which I felt for the first time a genuine homecoming. Like a foreigner in a familiar land, looking not for a place to call home, nor some nostalgic reprieve, but as a pilgrim looking for a way back up the mountain. When I had the opportunity to meet Arthur Green, I had many questions I've been waiting to ask him, questions that I've carried by myself alone for many years. Arthur graciously agreed to set aside time to sit one-on-one -on -one with me and to hear my questions out. Zevi asked if I could share the ensuing conversation with the larger Seekers community, and I said yes. And here we are. This conversation is neither a grand attempt to distill and introduce the ideas of neo hasidism to a larger audience, nor is it an in-depth exploration for those within the fold. The framing of the conversation rather is that of the insider, turned outsider, looking for a way back in. While we tried to ensure the language would be accessible to a wider audience, many of the points discussed without the right context and introduction might not be fully digestible. But I'm still happy that it is being shared, because while the language is particular to my own tradition, the journey, I believe, is one that will resonate with many of you from any religious community. For the seekers who struggle balancing authenticity with accessibility, for the programs who often travel alone. Let us travel alone together. And now to introduce Professor Arthur Green. Arthur Green is one of the world's preeminent scholars of Jewish thought and mysticism and a leading expert on Hasidism, the 18th century spiritual revival movement of Eastern European Jewry. Educated at Brandeis University in the Jewish Theological Seminary under the direct tutelage of a generation of great scholars, Alexander Altman, Nachum Glezer, and Avram Yeshua Heschel, may the memories be a blessing. He has himself taught several generations of students as professor of Jewish thought at Brandeis University and University of Pennsylvania, and as professor of Jewish philosophy and religion at the Rabbinical School of Hebrew College in Boston, which he founded in 2004. Over the course of his career, Professor Green has been the author, editor, and translator of over 20 volumes of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, Hasidism, and Neo-Hasidism. Notably amongst his scholarly works are Tormented Master, a life and spiritual quest of Nachman of Braslav, and Keter, the crown of God in early Jewish mysticism. But he's perhaps best known for his own theological writings, including Ehiya, A Kabbalah for Tomorrow, Seek My Face, A Jewish Mystical Theology, Radical Judaism, Rethinking God and Tradition, and Judaism for the World, Reflections on God, Life, and Love. 
Professor Green is also a leading figure in the Jewish renewal and Haver movement, and is a figurehead within the world of neo-Hasidism, a movement which aims to reapply Hasidic teachings to a contemporary life and revitalize Jewish spirituality for the 21st century. Through his scholarship, educational work, and popular teaching, combining historical knowledge with original theology, Professor Green has contributed to the growth and vitality of Judaism in America and throughout the world. It is truly a great honor to bring to you this conversation with Rabbi Professor Green. So I would say, I would say there are four questions that I wanted to talk about. Three of them are my, are my personal questions that I've had for a while. And I actually remember one time started writing a letter to you to send to you really? once I heard about it. And then I spent actually two nights ago, like a very long time trying to find the letter. In a way, I think it's better because that was my questions then. Yeah, yes. not my questions now. Um, so just going to say them out and then we can get into a free from dialogue. First question is, how do we preserve Judaism for a future generation? Like, how do we maintain it? And should my Judaism, or should Judaism be thought of more fundamentally as a Judaism that needs to be passed down? Right. Can we talk about that one and that pile of all up at once? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to just tell you what they are? No, and then go no. back? Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> because my mind will be clearer on this one if I don't have Everything the other else. three in the, in the back of my mind. Yeah. yeah. Can I yeah. Sure, well, I think the first task is to be honest with ourselves and honest with the people we're talking to. Uh, I can't preserve a Yiddishkeit that doesn't work for me because I think it should be preserved for Fayenim, for somebody else. Uh, it just doesn't work that way for me. And I can't pretend for my kids, I couldn't pretend for my kids that I am something I'm not because that would be a dishonest parenting. So, um, so it will take its own course and we cannot set it in advance in some in some plan that way. Uh, I can tell you a story. For a while, I was close with people in the Reconstructionist movement. And the great leader of the Reconstructionist movement in Los Angeles um, was um, uh, a rabbi named, um, named Winokur, Rabbi Winokur. He was the founder of the Reconstructionist Synagogue of Los Angeles. And he had a secretary, he was a secretary for 40 years or so, was very close to him. Her son turned Chabad and got married and got married in the, in, in, under the chuppah. The Chabad rabbi who married them wouldn't let Rabbi Winokur even participate in the ceremony, but he would let him say a few words afterwards. Mm. And the mother felt so desperately unhappy about the fact that her son had become a sugar from in her eyes. And Winokur turned around to the chuppah and said, don't worry, their children will be reconstructionists. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's nice to show you, that's the story. And, uh, and I think that's the way it may be. Um, if you raise your children with a lot of Yiddishkeit, they might turn out to be super, super from and drive you crazy because they might need to rebel against you, but you need to rebel against the religion you were brought up with. And they have the same right to rebel against you that you had to rebel against your parents. My wife and I both came from not completely non-observant Jewish homes, and we both got very deeply into Yiddishkeit. And we raised our only daughter, uh, day school, you know, modern day school throughout high school. She, in the end, said Akiba Academy ruined Judaism for me. And she didn't want to have anything to do with it for a long time now. It's a little bit different that she has children herself, but for a while she wanted nothing to do. It was very hard for us. But we said we have to give her the same right to do to us that we did to our parents. Um, sometimes I tell the story of Avram Avinu, of Abraham. Um, he had to lose two sons. He had to lose Yishmael, which must have been which was very hard for him, as we know. I'll know, you remember. He really cared about his son Yishmael. And then he had to put Isaac up on the altar. I said, why did, that, why did he have to go through those two things? And then I said, <coughs> maybe he had to pay a price for what he'd done to Terach. Hmm. Lech Lecha was very nice. He walked away, go to the land, I tell you, but he had a father. And he probably broke his father's heart when he smashed his idols and walked away. And maybe he had to learn the pain, what that pain was to lose a son. And uh, so, uh, so we can't, I'm saying, we cannot hope to dominate what the future of generations will be. We can be honest with ourselves and honest with our spiritual lives and honest with our children and hope something good will come out of it. So I, I feel like on the contrary, like for a lot of people there might be, a, their, their question would be, how do I keep my kids being Jewish to me? Like, it doesn't seem to bother me. 
you know what I mean? Like I would like, like I would love to give over to them the passion that I have and whatever they want to go for it. But then I feel, am I going the other extreme? Like, is there a place within one's personal avoda, within one's personal like work, to feel that it needs to be adjusted so that there is some form of uh, transmittability? It's hard to talk about children you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania the week my daughter was born. It happens I was teaching uh, legends on the on the binding of Isaac on the Akedah. I walked into class and said, I see this story completely differently now. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I understand. The Akedah story is not just about the complicated relationship I have with my father and my and my and my love and resentment and so on. The the story is about how God loves me like I love this baby who looks at me and doesn't even know how to smile yet, and doesn't even know how to turn me on by smiling, and yet I know I would give my life for her completely. And that's what it means to say God loves me. And I hadn't understood that until I had a kid. And uh, so it changes everything. So it's awfully hard to know. Um, but I, would say I, have, I have a love of this tradition. I want to see this tradition survive. I have a love of it because I associate that with my childhood and my grandparents and the world I was brought up with. But I also think that it's a great privilege. We are descendants of one of the great spiritual traditions of humanity. And some of those traditions have billions of followers and we have many fewer. And most of the people who are descended from that Yerusha, from that inheritance, either don't care about it, like most American Jews, most secular Israelis, or, or want to hold it so tight they're going to squeeze it to death and can't get anything good out of it. So we who are in the middle have a very special responsibility toward its creative future. And so I feel that. I feel that burden of responsibility. And I want it to survive. But I cannot do it in any way that makes me dishonest. I can't pretend. And uh, when I have students who become close students, I'm very honest with them about my my doubts and my questions and my bad days as well as my good days. And uh, and I think they will learn from that. I think that's the right way to be. Yeah, so I think the kind of the connects a little bit between the, the personal Judaism versus the Judaism in a community, right? So. And to me, it's, it's a similar question. It, to me, it's a little bit different because no matter what community you are part of, you always have to sacrifice something. That's the idea of joining, you know, a larger mm -hmm. uh, group, regardless. But but I think just this idea of. I mean, just let me say one more thing. Yeah. One of the things I love most, of course, is learning. Is the text, yeah. and my students, the people who become serious students of mine, are people who share that love of learning. And among the people I teach are people who are much more observant than I am. I have one very close Talmud who really sees himself as in the living in the Orthodox and Halakhic world. And I have students who are, who are much, much less observant than I am. But they all share a level of learning. We can all sit with a, we can all sit with a Hasidic Sefer and look up the sources and talk about them, talk about what it means today. And that's, that's a really important sharing. And that's, uh, that's much of what I want to communicate. And what they do with that learning, they're all going to use that learning. That learning is going to be important in all their lives. And how the more from student uses it, and how the more less observant student uses it, those are all their, the course of their lives and the course of their journeys. And I feel very blessed to have enriched those different journeys in this, in this gift of learning without saying to them, well, no, you have to do it this way, and you have to wear tzitzis, and you have to, and you have to do so and so. I'm, I'm not a you have to person. What, 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 what are your thoughts on, on, on just taking from it and just saying, yeah, at what point is it still Judaism if I'm just doing it however I want to? On some level, I think that's a bullshit question. Um, pardon me. No, absolutely. Um, I like that. Because <laughs> if you change anything, is it still authentic? If you change two things, is it still authentic? What's authentic? It can only be authentic if it's exactly the old way. So this goes back to the wonderful joke about the people from the three religions who get together and they decide we have to do something to make shalom, to make peace between the religions. So the Catholic comes up and says, you know, we really have to make peace with one another. We will give up birth. We will give up uh, uh, belief in the faith in the virgin birth. It's a very big deal for a Catholic to say that. 
And the Protestant gets up and says, all right, you know, we've been talking about it. We really want to come close to the people. We'll give up the Trinity. And they turn to the Jews and they look and they think and they talk and they debate three days. And finally they come back. Maybe the second you can <laughs> <laughs> You know? <laughs> Because we're so afraid to get go of anything. Because yeah. it won't be authentic. If we get go of anything, it won't be authentic. How can it be authentic if you don't have the second Yukon Burkin? And um, and let me go to your metaphor. I mean, here's a good Chabad, Chabadske metaphor. You're in the Rabbanu Shalom's navy. Rabbanu Shalom yeah. needs some new ships in his navy. doesn't need the same old ships all the time. You're going to build a new ship. You're going to build a new ship. You're oh. going to take. You're going to take the gunim, and you're going to take the, and you're going to take the. You're going to take the learning, and maybe you're not going to take the kashrus, and maybe you're not going to take the not turning a light on in Shabbos, whatever it is. But you're going to build a new ship, and that's going to be a very interesting ship. The Rebbeinu doesn't have just a Jewish navy; as the, the God has a universal navy. So you're going to bring in some meditation. You're going to bring in some sitting, and you're going to bring in, and you're going to bring in some new things that weren't there, and you're going to create something. And that's going to be a new flower in the Rabbanish Lelim's garden or a new ship in the Rabbanish Lelim's navy. And that's okay. I would like to see, my, my stake in your ship is to see that it's as richly endowed with the Jewish past you come from as you want it to be as it can be. And to encourage you to keep a lot of that richness because you have so much of it. Um, but exactly which parts you keep and which parts you don't keep, that's about your neshama. And that's your own journey and have to decide. And you don't have to decide at age 29 for what you're going to do at age 70. I certainly didn't. And um, and there may be a time later in life when you say, I want to come back to more observance in a way that doesn't feel oppressive and and uh, and burdensome to me. And if you if you if if you get there, you will. And uh, you know, it's a you're on, you're on a journey, but you're beginning this journey at this point with a lot of a lot of depth and richness from from those years inside the tradition and so and so use them well that's so use them well and combine them with other things and don't be afraid to don't be afraid to i see nothing wrong in your own life with the kind of spiritual syncretism if you ask me should we combine judaism with other religions and make one big religion i would say no yeah. because then each of these symbol systems works best in its own way and tampering with the symbols is a, little, is a little not good for anybody. You come, I think you'll come out with a weaker product. But um, but in your own life, you'll uh, you'll you'll bring things in, and uh, and my guess is that your rootedness in Yiddishkeit is so deep that it's going to remain the main the main spiritual language of your life. I feel that there is a certain feeling within me to to. The, uh, this connects to the next question, which is the difference between um, doing things that are quote unquote spiritual, but they just they feel good, right? It just it, 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 it's it gives me pleasure. It connects, and makes me feel good, versus an avoda or discipline, a work, a trying to grow, a trying to work. Um, and I feel that sometimes there's an idea of go going past myself and saying, okay, even though right now I don't necessarily feel or identify with a certain thing I, I i should engage regardless of right now if, it, if it, it's resonating with me so for example davening or prayer uh, from from a, from a text and um, when i was uh, when i was studying in yeshiva i i really spent hours breaking myself over it and it was really hard and and part of the reasons why i got so confused when i got into buddhism was because 15 minutes of, of silent meditation i felt so much more like I got so much further than spending three hours in 770 trying to like falling asleep and sitting and then the, like it felt so much clearer. So then the question is, OK, but is there a point of if I only do the parts of spiritual discipline that feels good to me versus um, saying I need to I should to a certain extent try and invest and go back to davening, re-engage, obviously do do my own way. The labels aren't important, but is there a point in saying I, I, I want to see if I can if I can find it in my old tradition. If I can find the old words, is there a point? Because this is the world that I came from. This is the, the world that I know. To try and engage with the parts of Judaism that didn't speak to me, uh, but trying to find a language within it that does speak to me. Mm. 
you came, unfortunately, of age at a very late period in Chabad's history. Because Chabad, of all things, had a deep meditative tradition, which was mostly lost by the mid-20th century. So I would say, I feel sad, I feel sad to hear you say, at 770, I had to sit and try to daven for three hours till I fell asleep. And then I went to a Buddhist place and I could meditate for 15 minutes. I, nobody ever told you to sit and close your eyes and meditate about how Soviv and Soviv and Mali are the same thing. The Soviv is Mali and the Mali is the Soviv. Uh, the God surrounding the world and God filling the world, the imminent and the transcendent. And they are really two aspects of the same thing. And opening your, opening your heart to the moment when those two meet one another and reveal themselves to be the same thing is a fabulous subject for meditation. And to do that instead of instead of saying tafnum, instead of instead of instead of grinding out all these mournful words that really don't belong to to where we are spiritually today, uh, would would make much more sense to me as a Jewish spiritual exercise. Again, I'm not the person who's going to say to you, you must do that instead of vipassana meditation. I'm just not. I'm just not a you must do person. Yeah. But it's there. It's there. Uh, to sit to sit for ten minutes with your eyes closed and say Yachid Chayolamim, which is something I do. I take the, I take I take a, a set of words that I like Yachid Chayolamim, and just live with that. And Olamim, of course, is both spatial and temporal. Um, you know, it's all the worlds and it's and it's all ages and they sort of flow together and that becomes a, that becomes a moment of transcending space and time, and in that in that oneness and the oneness of Yachid and it just becomes a place. A place that opens things up for me. So I'm saying the, 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 the opportunities are there. If you look at the sitter, not as something that you have to fulfill your obligation by rushing through the whole prayer book, but find yourself a phrase, find yourself a line that speaks to your heart that day. There's enough for a chakras. Do you mind translating that? Um, a God who, God who, well, God who shines light on the world and upon those who dwell on it compassionately. Hmm. Is, it, hmm. is it God's compassion on those who dwell or does God shine God's light on those who dwell compassionately upon the earth? So that's a, that's a, that's a thing to play with in your mind. That's a thing to play with in your mind. And that, that play, to me, in my experiences, that play opens me up and I find myself smiling and my, I find myself pretty happy with that kind of with that kind of wordplay meditation that I do so skillfully because every day we get so long in the Jewish game. Yeah. Um, but that's that, that's another way that's another way to use the Jewish liturgical materials. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Can I tackle a question which I heard you asking and you can tell me if I'm wrong but when we are opening ourselves up to a syncretic form of spirituality taking a bit from here, taking a bit from there, without being concerned of what the final product or label is, there seems to be some sort of a, an inherent threat that we might just be serving some sort of spiritual hedonism and not actually challenging ourselves to embrace the parts which we do find repugnant or we do find difficult or we do find challenging. A little more guilt, a little more guilt. Something else to be, <laughs> something else to be guilty about, Zippy. Congratulations, <laughs> you found something else to be guilty about. <laughs> But don't we sometimes create too easy of a spirituality for ourselves? It's never easy. It's never easy. It's got painful sides. It's got doubt sides. It's got depressing days when you don't believe in any of it. You think the whole thing is useless. And when it's good, let it be good and let it be happy. Uh, you know, I really, I was attracted to Chassidus because I felt that Baal Shem Tov understood, he wanted to create a religion, he wanted to create a Judaism that made people happier and less burdened with guilt rather than more burdened with guilt. Hasidism is the opposite of Musr that way. And, um, and I really feel this call, this call for Avedis Hashem Besimcha, serving God with joy, is what it's about. Um, you know, I just finished writing a book about Levi Yitzchak of Bredicha that's going to come out next year. He, in, the, in this revolution that was happening in the late 18th century, he was a very conservative figure. He said, oh, no, you can't have yourself pleasure in, in serving God. 
If you're pleasing yourself, if you enjoy serving God, you're only worshiping yourself. The, you have to, the whole goal has to be to give God pleasure. God has to have the pleasure. It's His pleasure. God created us so God would have pleasure. Uh, but not for us to have pleasure. But the Baal Shem Tov says, God is Tanu Kolata Anugim. God is the most, is the greatest pleasure of all. In the famous letter of the Baal Shem Tov to his brother in law, he see he does a Kalva Chomer. He says, he says the he says the intimacy of coming closer to God is greater than the intimacy of Hassan and Kala, of of of, of, men, of, of sexuality. He does a Kalva Chomer from sexuality. He says it's so sexual intimacy, divine intimacy is even greater, even more fun than sexual intimacy. Right? So it's meant to be, it's meant to be a great spiritual pleasure. And is the pleasure of God's or is the pleasure yours? Ha, ha, ha. There's only <laughs> one pleasure, right? Because the line between you and God for me is not such a sharp line. It's not like God's upstairs and you're down here and you're completely separate beings. So you're creating pleasure in the universe in this spiritual activity. And that's, and that's a creation. That's a creation. And it's to me, it's a gift. It's a gift to God as it's a gift to yourself. And I, I'm, I'm really on the Mori Nayim side there, not a Leviat Six side. I'm on the Baal Shem Tov side, not a Leviat Six side. I think he inherited some of the Magid's ascetic streak. And, and Shir Zalman did too, by the way. And, um, and I, think that, uh, I think that spiritual pleasure is good. Hmm. And, and, and if you have spiritual pleasure, that, is, that in itself is a gift to the one. Yeah. Thanks for opening up the permission <laughs> or reminding us. Yeah, no, I wanted to go back to the to the point before, um, not to harper specifically on davening, on prayer, but I think it, it's a perfect example because the, the language that I heard from you was there's a lot of opportunities within the davening, within the words to find the thing that connects to it, but there's an opportunity there. And I think the thing that... Opportunity opened, is the right word, yes. Yeah, so to me, that's where I'm struggling right now. It, the, 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 initially, was I was dedicated dogmatically, and then I left, and I said, "Okay, there's nothing there. I can't connect to it." And now I'm in a space where I see the beauty that I could potentially get out of there. But why? Why do I need to fit it into? Why do I need to find what? What not? What do I need to? The word I want to stay away from need or have to. But what would be the motivation in your eyes? To specifically find, go through the, the the pray book and then find the word there that speaks to me, if I'm quite content in and of itself doing a silent meditation or doing even a meta meditation or whatever it is, using another method that's not Jewish and saying, okay, but this to me, I'm getting what I, I I'm getting out of it already. Because, as I said before, you have this great privilege of being one of these Yorshim, of being one of these heirs who inherited this tradition. And it's a great gift of human spirituality, this tradition. And you're one of the people who can pick it up and do something creative and worthwhile with it. There are lots of people who could do meta, meta meditation. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do or you shouldn't do it. But I'm saying you're missing an opportunity to use something that is uniquely yours. And you're one of a relatively small group of people who can make worthwhile and creative use of it. And we, the Jewish people, need you to be open to that mm. because so, you have this special gift. So that's a line, ne not necessarily is it for my kids, but there is a certain idea of responsibility for Judaism as a whole. For the tradition, yes. There is a, okay. Yes, I think so. Okay. So that's, that's why I still feel, I don't know if I feel apathetic. I, I'm, I'm still exploring it, but I think that's the point, whether it's the children, whether it's the outside world, whether it's for a thing, it's, and, I, and I really hear that and I respect that idea of, of the richness and the uniqueness of being in this, in, this, in, this, in this world. But if we were just to look exclusively towards one's own personal practice. spiritual practice, one's own Nevada, do you still think there's a... Yeah, so whether it's specifically davening, again, it's, it's just a prayer. If it's, whether that one or any one specifically, is it like, is there anything within me to specifically try for my own personal work, my own personal development to try and, 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 and find the language, like to constantly re-engage with whether it's the text, whether it's with certain rituals, whether it is. Listen, suppose I say um, you might, uh, uh, you might say, 
I could get higher by doing Zen sitting. Is your job in life to get high? Is that the most important thing? Uh, maybe you're here for something else. You have to decide what am I? What's 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 my purpose? What am I doing in this world? Um, yeah. That. Um, and that's that goes from my Lev Yitzhak reading too. Sometimes he says, sometimes he says, the tzaddik who can get high is uh, is not as important as the tzaddik who can bring bring bracha to other people. And doing it, doing it in a way that can bring can bring blessing to other people, um, is more important than than getting higher. It's something you can get low. <laughs> I guess that also it's a good transition to the third point. <clears throat> but um, one of the things when I was doing the post mortem on my yeshiva days and, and and that world, one of the things that I felt very disheartened by was realizing that even though I went to a fantastic yeshiva and guys were very dedicated, there was a very strong chassidishkeit. You can translate that word. Chassidism. <laughs> Chassidism. Yeah, but it's <laughs> a, a, Hasidicness. a Hasidicness. Yes. But then I realized that the guys who I felt were the most chassidish, the most invested and embodied in the, in the Hasidicness, were the ones who had the biggest spiritual egoism, who, who like the classic joke about Chabad is, the Chabad talks about bittul nullification all the time, but we're the biggest mitzvahs, we're the biggest yesh, we're the biggest egos. Mm -hmm. And and realizing this point where I felt, one of the things that I felt really hurt by the system was I dedicated myself towards this ideal that I thought, and in this ideal was nullification, was towards a refinement, an edelkite. And then looking back and realizing that the system as it exists today, maybe not classic to what Chabad was supposed to be or what you know it is for unique few Yechadi Read to a much bigger egocentricism and spiritual egoism, um, then I then I was led to believe that I that I thought. So when I started going on my own path and doing this form of synchronism, taking from here and from there, talking about what you said just now about doing the thing not for getting high but for doing good, in Chabad, the the, the, the theology is so clear. What's that? What's the kavana? You know, what's the divine presence to bring Mashiach to Dirb Tachtonim to make a dwelling place? Specifically, like everything was so clear, the end goal was there. If, if I'm now not in any particular tradition and I'm not trying to label, I'm trying to follow one specifically, then how do I, what is the metric that I can do as to what's the good beyond what feels good or what feels right to me? First of all, um, you're a nice tall guy. Had they sent you to basketball academy instead of to Chabad Yeshiva, you would have found the guys who get the ball in the basket most have the biggest egos. Yes. Right? <laughs> and that's the game. That's the game of being a teenager. And um, spiritual maturity is not something that the educational system is very good at. It rewards a lot of immature behavior and a lot of immature enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, some people outgrow it and some people get soured by it. And some people are the same way their whole lives. You can meet... 60 year olds who are the same same immature spiritual teenagers they were because they never grew up and that's true in the whole world it's true in the basketball universe as much as it's true in the chabad universe so i don't think it's too it's too it's too unique it's too unique that i think this this has more to do with the with the competition and you know you're, you're in a world where competitiveness is not is not something that's supposed to be valued so people find bitter ways to be competitive because that's 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 teenage boy psychology. Um, I'm sorry, without labeling, you, I, I lost the train there for the next piece of this. Just remind me with a few words. Yeah. So the the question was just more about that. How how am I now, if I'm not in any particular tradition, supposed to find out what is the good? What is the good? Uh, I think you probably are a smart enough guy, and a balanced enough guy to have taken away some pretty essential values from your years in the Hasidic world. If I say menschlichkeit and edelkeit, you know what I mean. I don't know exactly how to translate either of those terms into, into, into English. Uh, human, human decency, mm. um, uh, delicateness of spirituality, sensitivity, awareness, 
I think you've picked up those things uh, just from what I hear of you. And those are things that are universal human virtues, but they were cultivated in a certain way in the, in the, in the Jewish world we came from. And uh, it makes sense to think about those things and articulate them for yourself and say, no, I'm not going to do that act because that's not a menschlich thing to do toward other people. That's not, that's not a decent thing to do. And I think you know that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be categorized in halachic isurim, halachic, this is forbidden behavior and that's forbidden behavior, but in, but in the sort of sense of, of this, the essential values that you learned from growing up as a religious person. And that means the value of tzelem elukim, treating other people decently. Uh, there are places where, where, where my Jewish soul is offended by certain kinds of behavior uh, because of essential values I picked up and to treat other, the Jews should treat other human beings like that. I, I just have understood. I just have internalized those values. And I think you probably have too. Um, so I can't give you a specific metric and say, you know, certainly not in the language of Isra Vahetir, certainly not in the language of permitted and forbidden, but some things I can say forbidden, yes. Uh, there are certain things, you know, that we, we, we should know better than that. And if we didn't, then all this chassidus didn't teach us very much. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and there are hard places, there, there are hard questions. I don't have answers to all the moral questions in life. Uh, you know, in the United States, people are going crazy about this issue of abortion. Yeah. And I know that it has to be decided on the basis of Tzela Melukim. But I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not for casual abortions. Because I do think there's a mystery in conception. And there's a divine moment there. And, and I don't feel one should just... But of course, if the woman's life is in danger, and of course, if if the child is not going to have a decent life and so on, then I think there's Yeshua yeah. Malzaber. I'm not, I'm not trying to pascal the Shaira on that question here. I'm just saying there are moral questions that I don't have that there aren't easy answers to. Yeah. And, uh, and we have to struggle with it. I don't know if, if I'm answering your question, but you know. So, so it actually reminded me that um, when I was in Yeshiva, my, one of the reasons I got very into it was because for the first time in, in, my, in my year studying, I finally found a person that represented Chassidishkeit, the way that it really felt, and he was uh, my mashpia, my spiritual mentor yes. for a few years, and he was, and whenever I would speak with him personally, every single time we'd always be, but the, the main point, Shal, is to be a mensch, again and again, mm -hmm. and really resonates with me, but to me, I would say that's compassion, to, 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 to work, to be compassionate is an extremely hard place to get to. And it's constantly something that I feel is definitely part of my avoid, it's something that I work on. But to me, that's a very clear goal. It's something very clear to work on B'Tzal Malakim, to work on Fahafta Lech trying aspire aspirations towards loving mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, but when we talk about the idea of, let's say, the more Hasidic, the more Kabbalistic idea of refining the oneself, the nullification, the idea of not self-identification, like, to me, it, it felt that the Hasidic world talked about it a lot. But then you got into this game and, and what I was trying to explain before was this idea that under the pretense of nullification, we were actually creating big and bigger egos. Chang Yang Trungpa talks about the idea that a person takes from this tradition, this tradition, he just gets more and more armor till he can't move. Yes, well, I think, I think one has to take an intelligent middle path there. To me, spirituality is always about ego transcendence. It's always about getting beyond oneself and one's own needs. Uh, to me, being a decent human being has a lot to do with getting beyond oneself and one's own needs. If we have a conversation like this, if somebody comes to talk to me about their spiritual needs, my responses have to be about their needs, not about my needs. I'm letting go of my needs in this conversation. Right? My needs aren't important in this conversation. I'm here to respond to you. And you have to learn how to do that. So yes, it's about ego transcendence. The struggle for utter self-negation and utter disappearance of the self, I think is uh, exaggerated in an unhealthy way in some of the Hasidic sources. 
I think the Magid and 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 Vashaz went a little too far with Bittu mm -hmm. and made it made it in such an extreme exercise that it became it became ego defeating rather than rather than rather than slipping beyond it rather than transcendence rather than light transcendence so i think you have to find for you not for me but for you the right the right amount of that i think yes it's not all about it's not you know we're not you're not going to be a hedonist it's not all about immediate pleasure for yourself um there is a world there are other people there are bigger there and there's bigger things than you in this world and you know that and uh and uh, and it's also not about spending your life trying to trying to disappear trying to trying to make yourself non be yeah. and where where in that spectrum you fall is something that you will deal with and live with yeah there's a famous atlasha battle which says like how do you know if you're on the right if it's the it's a horror or the it's a tov how do you know if it's the good inclination or the bad inclination telling you? And the, the answer that they give is whatever leads you to do more mitzvahs. Um, so I, I guess maybe if I can rephrase that in this way, when we're talking about trying to find a delicate path, doing what's, what's the good and whatever that means, or trying to find the right path, not in the sense of like, how do I know that I've, that I've received? I, I, well, your answer about giving and not receiving is, resonates a lot, but it's the sense of how do I know that I'm, following, let's say, the Yitzhah HaTov, another Yitzhah Hara, within one's own spiritual path. Let's say. You know, in Ishbitz, which I don't learn too much, but I, I do something, they talk an awful lot about Birurim. Birurim. You have to figure it out. You have to clarify it. You have to check your own Check your own honesty. And, uh, you know, it's postcards can sort of look at yourself, look at yourself in the mirror carefully and say, why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? And where is it going to lead? And, uh, and figure out that process. You're an intelligent person and you're responsible for your own spiritual life. And you have to take it, you have to take it on seriously and ask yourself tough and honest questions and you'll figure it out. And sometimes you'll make mistakes in life. We all make mistakes in life. Um, uh, I don't much like the Yetzir Hari Yetzir Tov terms because I don't think we are so radically divided between, uh, you know, we are a tabula rasa playing against good and evil. I much prefer the Moach Klipa model to the Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hara model. The Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hara model is the person's a tabula rasa and there's these two forces fighting, fighting it out on that battlefield. And the Mohu Klippa model is there's something good and beautiful inside and it's got to get through the Clippers, it's got to break through the Clippers to come out. Um, so the Mohawk is essentially good. Um, that's a more Kabbalistic model. And, uh, and I like that model better. Um, but yes, there are, there, are, there are places where you don't know where there are sort of you are, you are tempted to, uh, to do something and maybe you, man, maybe you shouldn't. And there's no, you know, you have, you have two things to guide you. You have, uh, you have a tradition and wisdom that you come out of, and you have friends, you have dear friends like this guy here, who are going to, are going to somehow say, sure, yeah. don't be a jerk, you know, and you're going to, if only you would tell me when I'm being a jerk, you know, and you're going to figure it out. Yeah. And I don't think I have a, you know, better so, answer than that for you, but that's pretty good. So just on that point, those, 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 those two things are called Yochanu Voas, you know. Mm -hmm. Tradition and friends, tradition, tradition and community. Friends. So, uh, I have one last question, but before I go there, it just brought up this question about following the Teresa Bashemtov, the Bashemtov's way, and, and the Chassidus, and it seemed constantly within the classic framework was the need of a Rebbe or a Guru figure to help one oneself align or, or make sure that they're on the path. I have my own path, I'm doing my own thing, I'm taking what I want, I'm engaging, I'm trying to find the balance. But what is your thoughts on a selich rab making for yourself a teacher or, or a rabbi in that in that in that space? Um, listen, uh, we all know we all know the dangers of charismatic leadership, and we all know the Sasaki Roshi stories and the Berlin stories and the and the terrible stories. Um, and 
and we um, we all know the good stories, but even in the good stories, there are bad stories. I think dependence on the Rebbe is not a good thing. Um, I think having models in your life who uh, who show you by their example how to live and how to do it is a good thing to have. I don't think you necessarily need one. And I think you find such people in your life, and you find such people for a little while, and then maybe you move on from them. So you walked into my courtyard here for 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 a couple of days, and you know maybe maybe we'll stay in touch for a couple of years, and maybe we won't, and you know, and then you you know, sure. uh, and uh, I uh, I Zalman uh, I had I was never able to let myself be a rebbe because I never was able to accept a rebbe. I had two very good candidates who wanted to be my Rebbe, Heschel and Zalman. And I would not leave it, it would be my Rebbe. Um, and so I felt I could not let myself be a Rebbe because I, I was not able to submit because I was too independent and too eclectic and too much wanting to be myself and not wanting to follow anybody else. I was very close, I was very close to Zalman for many years, but I insisted that he be a friend and not a Rebbe. So other people go to him for brachas. I would never do that, you know. Hmm. Uh, things like that. We, but we had a very dear friendship, you know. And uh, that's who I am. And just and so now, uh, now as I've gotten this old, some people are trying again to make me into more of a rabbit. And I'm a little more willing because I think I'm pretty harmless, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I think I'm old enough to be pretty harmless. Hmm. So, uh, so I find it a little less. I find it a little less dangerous and threatening than it once was. And for yourself, for myself, in, in terms of the harm I could do to other people, I don't think mm -hmm. I'm, I don't think I'm likely to harm people very much at this point in life. Yeah. I was always very afraid to be a rabbi because then they would find my clay feet, and then they'd be hurt and disappointed and wounded by it. Mm -hmm. And I have clay feet, and so and I didn't want that to do that to people. Um, I didn't want to be idealized and then disappoint. Um, but as I say, now I'm old enough and it doesn't feel like such an issue. All right, we got to wind up. We got to wind up. Yeah. Uh, so just to, to, to wind up, the question just is, what do you see? Or what do you see as the future of uh, New Hasidism today? Um, I would say what you see and what you hope as well. Yes. But, but and, and on that, and you can answer however much you want, both for neo Hasidism as a whole and for those, for those many of us who grew up in the Hasidic world and are now trying to. Yeah. Well, neo Hasidism as a whole has so many different aspects. I mean, my goodness, there's what I do and there's what uh, some Orthodox rabbi in Long Island does and there's what you guys are doing coming out and there's what they're doing in Tekoa. And um, and and what they're doing, uh, uh, you know, in um, in, um, in 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 Dov's Shir, in in Dov's Shirim in uh, where, where he's teaching, and they're they're all very very different. And I think there is a new discovery, both of the wisdom of of early Hasidic sources, but also of a kind of spiritual revival in Judaism, and I hope it's going to catch on and develop into, I don't know if I want to call it a movement or a, or a renewal or a rebirth. So I hope guys like you will be teachers of it. I hope guys like you will, will wind up finding, finding Hasidim and leading communities and, and being teachers, uh, whether it's rabbis of, 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 of communities or whether, it's, or whether you not want that word rabbi because it got too polluted for you, which I understand. I almost refuse to accept Mesmicha. Because I couldn't stand it. My smicha document is still wrapped up in the same wrapped up container. It's cardboard. I got it in because I would never put it on my wall because I, I didn't like it. And didn't, you know, I didn't believe in it at the time. Uh, so maybe you won't do it as rabbis. Maybe you'll do it as teachers. Maybe you'll do it as uh, as community organizers or leaders. But I think you've got the, you've got you're imbued with a kind of spirit and and uh, and, and 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 spiritual powerful teaching that you've got something to give. And I hope you realize, hey, I've got something to give in the world and people want it. And I want to find a way to, to do it. And it might be your own eclectic package that's going to be refined over the next couple of decades. And that's great. And yours will be different. And you'll have a rich other occasionally. And uh, um, 
that's that's what I hope. Yes, that's what I hope. And that somehow all these different Zuramim will get together somehow, and people will look back 50 years from now and say, you know, there was a very interesting development from 2020 to 2070, and Judaism has changed and is more vital in ways we didn't expect because of this of this spiritual rebirth that happened. And, and I hope occasionally they'll look at Green's books, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Zaza. You know, that's what I hope. Yeah, that's what I hope and expect. And expect. I think they're, they're not very different. So I'm, fe I'm feeling very cheerful. Now, let's hope that Israel doesn't have a terrible war. Yeah. Let's hope that the planet doesn't, doesn't become unlivable. Let's hope that Trump doesn't become president and, uh, and, uh, and, and do it. Let's hope Putin doesn't start a nuclear war. You know, there are, there are bigger things going on in the world that may affect all of this spiritual journey we're on. And we do have to pay attention to those things too. And, and you know, I'm something of an activist on some of those issues. And uh, especially on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the environmental and on the Israel-Palestine issue, I feel a great sense of urgency about being involved. But, uh, but given, 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 given that we have the spaciousness for this thing to grow, I think it is going to grow in interesting ways. And, and I think you guys are part of it. What's the one thing the community needs to know for it to succeed? Huh? What's the one thing that this, that this burgeoning re like rebirth needs to know or needs to embody if it's going to succeed? Uh, to be honest, no lies, and uh, and to be deep and rich and open-hearted at the same time. Open-heartedness does not cannot work with lies. And I would say, doing 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 it that way, understand understanding that spiritual integrity mm. is very important to uh, to a real spiritual life. Mm. 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 <laughs> time. Oh wait, there's a pop. <laughs> 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 it's back is the Negan. Yeah, it says over here, by the way, spontaneous dancing. <laughs> Oh, okay. Apparently we'll do that after. <laughs>